Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us and participating in our fireside chat using technology for criminal investigations. The work of criminal investigators is becoming more and more complex. The technology is changing the environment every day and most police agencies are far behind the curve. There are thousands of small and medium sized agencies that lack the resources to respond to these kinds of changes. In today's discussion, we will focus on how agencies can adapt to the new technology within the limited means and resources that they have available. My name is Marissa Trejo. I'm Wati Success Manager. A little bit about me is I'm located in our Sacramento, California location. I had joined Wati last year in coordination with my family's law enforcement background. I never knew the crucial side of the technology um, when they're patrolling until I had actually worked for Wati. So it's been very rewarding to be on the technical side of law enforcement while my family is on the other end. Um, so every second counts when technology is able to assist, it truly makes a difference. And today with me is uh, Krishna, he's our managing partner and I'll go ahead and turn it over to him. Uh, thank you, Marisa. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to folks joining from East Coast. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Krishna Chandrapati and uh, I've been working on providing technology solutions to uh, government and law enforcement agencies for the last 20 plus years and uh, providing like uh, innovative solutions to sp specifically to law enforcement agencies with a limited means and budget has been my passion and I've been doing it for the last seven years here in the uh, state of California. And I'm just really look, looking forward to the uh, very interactive session today. Uh, back to you, Marisa. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. So this is really going to be like an informal chat. We want to keep it casual and make it an informative session for you all who have joined us today, mostly focusing about the new technology features that are available for law enforcement. So please feel free to ask any topic questions uh, regarding today's webinar um, using the chat window. So our monitors will go ahead and take up the questions you have and we can provide more information to you. Um, if, we can't, uh, if we can't answer any questions, uh, we will definitely do some research and get back to you. Again, uh, just please utilize the chat window if you have any questions. Let's see, and then I did also wanna to mention to you um, all today, we are going to make it a little bit interesting. <laughs> so we're gonna provide some quizzes for the audience to go ahead and answer. Um, so please respond to the quiz in the chat window, of course, so utilize that, that's gonna be your friend. Uh, the respondent to, with the correct answer will be provided a small prize, which is an Amazon gift card. All right, Krishna. Okay, thank you. Uh, lots of interesting topics to cover today. Uh, it's mostly towards the technology, technology side of it, you know, we would be, talking about like facial recognition, tattoo recognition, mobile investigations, heat maps, and not necessarily in this order, but we will cover or talk about a little bit about each of these topics, social media integration, LPR, investigative leads, uh, how the consolidated systems work, uh, a little bit on the mobile investigations as well. Uh, with this, we can move to the, we can jump, dive in right into the uh, presentation. Let's start with uh, facial recognition. So with facial recognition, we hear a lot about facial recognition in law enforcement these days. Krishna, how does facial recognition work and how does it help officers in solving the crimes? Well, uh, you know, back about, you know, uh, three, four years ago, the facial recognition was actually limited to uh, just an edit view, you know maybe some big agencies, maybe CIA or FBI, you know, some of these agencies were able to afford it. You know? Thanks to the, the technology explosion, especially in artificial intelligence, so this technology is now available in open source, which essentially makes it really uh, affordable as well as accessible to even any of the smaller agencies. And you can see several of these uh, implementations in uh, you know, areas like Google search, like image search, you have those as well. Now, one of the implementations that is uh, more flexible and easy, it's called uh, Keras AI. Again, it all deals with artificial intelligence. And the way it works is that uh, any of the images that are there, especially if you take any of these mugshots or the booking photos, 
these images are calculated or translated into a mathematical number the, uh, based on the distance between the cheekbones and, and the forehead to chin and so on. I think they are they're called image embeddings. So these are calculated as a mathematical numbers. And then when you have another image that comes back and you want to match against the images that you have, uh, it again translates back into a mathematical number and then it does the search. Uh, it's, it's very effective and it's been, uh, uh, we have been put it into uh, hands of even the patrolling officers as well as not just the criminal investigators, but even to the patrolling officers and it's, uh, uh, we could see the positive results on it. So you would agree that the officers have seen a benefit from it? Uh, it definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. It is especially useful, you know, uh, you know, these days almost every uh, home has got a ring pictures and, you know, there are a lot of surveillance cameras. You know, certain, certain times you capture those images and, you know, you can actually input those images or insert, I mean, uh, submit those images to this tool and they can, this process and then actually can actually verify and see if it matches or not and comes back with the information. Uh, for example, in this one, if you see like, you know, there's a sample here, I think it's, it's, it's of this celebrity here. So, and we, this person's image now he's wearing a hat and he's like towards us tilted to the side but even then the system can actually look at it uh master a straight picture or so and then come back and uh, you know come back with a result on matching photos if you have in your booking photos database or you know in your uh, mugshot database and i can also talk about a few other features too like uh you know uh, in terms of the effective use that you're talking about, uh, I think the officers, I see that at least on a weekly basis in the last seven or eight months on a weekly basis, at least about two or three times that, you know, where the, either the crime investigators or the patrolling officers have actually used this feature to actually have a successful match, uh, each of the different officers. And then, uh, and there is a one story where, uh, this is a really this is some real story that happened. You know, they actually had a made a stop on a suspect, and when they asked for his name, he gave an incorrect obviously gave an incorrect name, and the officer just used his mobile phone, took a picture, input the input the photo into the system, and uh, it came back as he has an outstanding warrant. So that the system actually works, and you know that's uh, an arrest was made just using the system out in the in the field. Back to you, Marisa. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience at all in regards to the facial recognition? Feel free to use the chat box, the little chat window that you have, if you guys have any questions. And I would like to add, uh, in terms of uh, the images too, of course, in the example that was shown here, I think we were using a a different, a little bit higher end, uh, uh, what you call a uh, high resolution image. But even if you happen to have, uh, when you get something from a mugshot, I mean, get something from a surveillance camera or a ring camera, you know, the angle may be different. You know, the picture may not be, you know, at a high resolution. But I think even then, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, this particular uh, AI feature, which is used by Keras AI, I think that uh, actually can come back with a, a decently positive match. And again, you have a threshold too. It's not like, you know, it comes back with a hundred percent match every time. It, For example, in this one, even though it made a match, it shows like, you know, the conference score of what, 69% or so. Uh, it can come back with, the you can set up a threshold on what the kind of match that you want. And usually the images can come back with whatever threshold that you have set, if it actually matches it. Krishna, we actually have a couple of questions in regards to the facial recognition. I'll start off with the first question. Is yeah. facial recognition legal to use in California? Uh, facial recognition has always been a, a controversial topic. Uh, the way I understand uh, is that you cannot do a constant profiling of people. Like you put a surveillance camera at one place and you know keep taking pictures of them and trying to profile it. But 
in the in the situation that we are talking about is you know you think there's a suspect and you want to you have your own booking database and you're trying to match this particular suspect with the database that you have and i believe according to my understanding it is is legal but again the the complaint standpoint and the legality standpoint we we'll leave it to the agencies uh, i think here we just want to talk about what the technology offers and what the what what are the features that we have in technology that can actually help the officers it always happens and here also we have seen that you know the laws take time to catch up with the technology and it, i believe this is one of those scenarios and situations Thank you, Krishna. We also we also have another question. Uh, this is a good question. What is the time frame of the results of the search? Is it an hour? Is it a day? No, it's instant. Thirty seconds. Uh, Thirty seconds. So, yeah, the the way it works is that I think I talked about or explained that image embeddings aspect of it now. So, and I was talking about the real time scenario earlier. You know, which is a. Uh, uh, you actually was some an officer was on the field taking a picture searching back and coming you know that's that's really instant instantaneous it's about 30 seconds uh what we do is all the booking photos those image embeddings that i'm talking about are actually pre-calculated and kept in the database and with that particular number only when you insert the picture or input the picture that's the one that's calculated for the num number and after that it's a number to number match before you come back with the result so it's uh, it's instantaneous uh gets back in 30 seconds. The rest of the other text-based searches can be much faster, but because this is an image-based, it takes about 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you for answering that question. Yeah, and I just want to add to that. And this, uh, at, the inst at the places where we are doing it or implementing and searching, uh, this actually searches across millions and millions of uh, photographs on the mugshots. Uh, Many of the smaller agencies may not have millions of pictures, so it can even be faster than 30 seconds. Thank you. So I, I, following the next slide, um, what, is, what is link analysis and how does it work? Yeah, so link analysis is a really powerful networking tool. Uh, it's used to figure out the relations between you know, persons, vehicles, records, addresses, uh, any of the other entities that are related to a person, you know. Uh, and then it actually gives you a pictorial representation. It depicts the entire links and relations in a pictorial format. And at that time, you know, user can actually drill down in any of the nodes, uh, double click on it and find out uh, links and actually discover some of the critical details, you know, and then establish links that are otherwise, you know, not possible, actually establish or find just by doing it uh, manually. That's actually in a summary is link analysis. So how does it save time for the officers? Well, it's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a tremendous amount of time that is saved. You now, what happens is, you know, when, a, when an officer tries to investigate, you know, they have multiple different systems that need to go through. And uh, often it's difficult to, establish those links or map uh, each of the links, but you know, and usually officers might take with all the data issues that are there and so on, you know, the office might actually take, you know, sometimes weeks or even months to actually establish. Now what takes a months or weeks uh, with the tool that's available, it's actually done in a matter of minutes. Again, it's a significantly time saving tool, not only time saving, but also, you know, uh, discovers and uncovers, you know, vital information that's needed for investigation. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience in regards to this link analysis? Feel free to use the chat window. Okay, we can probably move on to the next topic. Thank you. Investigators use multiple systems like record management systems, warrant systems, parole, jail management systems, etc. How can we find the vital information that's needed in investigations when there are so many systems to find information across? This uh, 
is an interesting thing. I think we, we can talk about any of the technology features, uh, but building a consolidated system is the heart of uh, any of the investigation platform. You know, uh, For any of the effective investigations to happen, uh, you need to get all the data across systems that you're talking about, you know, whether it's a record management system, even for a smaller agency, there are multiple systems. Uh, you have a record management system. Uh, there will be a probation data. Uh, there is probably a warrant system. You have your own dis dispatch, temporary dispatch for the 911 calls. Uh, the, the, you, you have your mugshots. And sometimes there are external agencies, with external agency systems too, which is the jail management systems and so on. Now we have to get all this data together. Uh, that is one. And each of these data, there is no standardization. You know, each of these data have, for example, a simple example is that, you know, uh, if you take a gender, it can be M or F in one system. It can be male or female in another one or X or Y. Uh, for each of these systems to understand each other, I think all those data has to be standardized. Uh, second thing, the data verification is very critical and the enrichment aspects of it. You know? uh, if you go to a bank, you will make sure that you know, you'll give your right SSN or you provide your right first name, last name and so on. Uh, but when it comes to criminal data, when somebody stops and asks for the information, you know, usually end up getting incorrect data. You know, either they flip the driver's license numbers or give the incorrect SSN, give incorrect first name, last name, and so on. So there are a lot of challenges when trying to investigate with the data. So I think having the data, consulting that, constantly making sure that you clean it up, verify it, put it together, uh, that's absolutely crucial for you know any of the investigations. So building that consolidated system is, is the first step that has to happen. And once you build it and set it up, and there are several tools, like whatever I talked about, like Keras AI or uh, natural language processing, anything that you can set it up on top of it. Once you have it, uh, you can uh, use the data for uh, searching it, mining it. I uh, can use it for the collaborative investigations, uh, as well as you know any of the, because you have all this data together, you can actually start doing some analysis and analytics on top of it. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely critical and essential to have it. And uh, uh, in, in my experience in the last five years, I think that's what we have been doing it uh, with several of the agencies, getting all the data together and setting up processes and uh, procedures actually to make sure that we clean the data. And that we have done this across pretty much any standard, uh, industry standard uh, products that are available outside in the market. Any, any questions? Yes, so it looks like we have a question. How can you validate data for authenticity? That's a very good question. Uh, there are a number of ways that you do it. Uh, so you can actually go out to the external agencies and validate for the authenticity. And I think when, uh, if you're interested further, I think we can actually maybe have a detailed demo on how can this be done. Uh, I'll, I'll just give an example. For example, for address, if they give an incorrect uh, address and so on, you have an option to go back and check on USPS and verify the data. Uh, for driver's licenses, you can go back to the external systems and verify on the DMV side. Uh, uh, these are a couple of examples, and then you can actually verify data against some of the utility databases, the system databases, to make sure that is you know, whatever the information is given is accurate. And also, the Social Security Administration has got web services. Uh, essentially, it's it's interfaces where you can actually, uh, if you have an understanding or you know if you have an MOU with them, you can actually uh, access those and verify if those uh, the data that's given is uh, correct or not. And that is on the authenticity side, the verification or validation of the data. And the second aspect is on the data enrichment itself. You know, for example, uh, sometimes uh, the there is some data missing. You know, either you miss out a city name or a zip code, or sometimes there are typos that you can actually even verify. Uh, there are algorithms and tools that can actually verify that information and uh, make sure that you enrich the data. You don't update or correct the data, but you can have additional fields or columns where you capture the corrected data. And that's again important for you to have a right level of investigation because if you try to search 
I'm just giving an example. It's 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 a trying to search for a John Smith, but uh, he's actually in the system as Joe Smith or Jay Smith, and it does not match. Uh, you will never get the results. Uh, the system need to have that intelligence, where uh, even if you type John Smith, that you understand that you're actually looking for a Joe Smith based on different parameters, that you, that be based on different demographics, and it can give back that information. Uh, so it's a combination of verifying against external data sources, as well as having systems and algorithms where uh, the system can actually predict or understand what the potential accurate data is. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you, Krishna. Okay, I believe the following slide is gonna be our first quiz. So what is the technology used for facial recognition? This is your so opportunity. You have, <laughs> you have 30 seconds to answer this. Someone got it. We have someone who has it. Okay. Two people got it right. Okay. So the answer is Keras AI. A lot of you got that right. Good job. Uh, do you know who got it right, Marissa? Yes, it's our friend Gladys. Congratulations, Gladys, <laughs> for getting it right. Awesome, so we'll keep in touch. So one of the lesser heard or used technologies, but very effective is tattoo search. So how can tattoos be used for identi identifying persons? You're right, Marissa. I think people talk a lot about, you know, facial recognition and so on. But uh, I believe that tattoo search uh, is going to be a game changer, you know. Uh, the Criminals have become smart enough these days where, uh, I mean, they know about the surveillance cameras all around. So they actually wear complete masks when they go out and, you know, and perform anything. And even if you have a surveillance pictures, like the recent ones in the riots and so on, I think they were of no use. Yeah. The, the, whereas the tattoo search, it actually uses a different algorithm. We talked about Keras AI, which is again an artificial intelligence uh, algorithms and so on. Uh, but tattoo search actually uses a different algorithm called OpenCV. It's, it's based on density in the image and so on. And uh, especially in the scenarios where you just get uh, image of an arm or a hand or you know or a leg with a certain tattoo, and you still want to investigate, and that's the only clue that you have. Uh, tattoo search can be a, you know phenomenally a game changer for you know investigating officers. So what should police departments do to leverage this technology? Uh, so in order to leverage this technology, I think one of the things that officers should do, uh, I think right now in, in the process of booking, you know, most of the times they just use the mug shots and they just capture the, the face like, like over here. Uh, and they just track or note down the SMT information, you know, uh, but rather SMT is nothing but, you know, the scars, marks and tattoos. Uh, along with the booking photos, because now that the storage itself is not very really expensive, uh, if the if the officers can or if the booking if the agencies can start taking images of the tattoos as well, at least the visible tattoos, you know that would be really beneficial and you know effective in trying to find uh, matches to the tattoos. And we just started this on an experimental basis in one of the agencies. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a it's a feature or a facility or tool. I know that a lot of the officers are really uh, appreciative of. It, it will be a game changer in the in the coming uh, years. I definitely agree with you. Do we have any questions from the audience regarding the tattoo search? We have one question so far. Does tattoo recognition pick up different colors? It's a great question. Uh, yeah, it does. It's it's really not 
based on the color. I think the way it works is is more based on uh, takes the image, uh, and then it it, just, it defines on where the density is there in the image, and based on that it tries to map it to the, the again the same concept of trying to match the pictures, but it's more of uh, you know matching the densities. That, on the on the image side, I think we're talking on the facial recognition side. We're talking about you know the dimensions and you know mathematical number. Whereas it comes to tattoos, it's more of density. So it works the same way. I mean, it can match any different color. Another great question I have for you, Krishna. Does this data come from prison data prison data sources, or can it be web scrapped from the internet for like from social media posts? Oh, yeah, you know, it, it can be from social media posts as well. You can take it or you can take it from the internet and you can search on that. Absolutely. It does not have to be from uh, either the booking photos or the jail photos now. Mm. Okay. It can be, again, coming from surveillance cameras, uh, ring pictures, uh, any of those, you can still match it. Thank you. And I think that wraps it up for the questions regarding tattoo search. So how is voice assistant useful for law enforcement? Okay, that's, it's, it's an inter interesting topic. You know, uh, uh, these days, you know, the voice assistance has become a part of our daily life. You know, when you want to turn on the lights or turn on the music, turn off lights, find the score, you know, you probably, if you want to turn on lights and off, you know, probably talk to Alexa. You, you want to find a score, you maybe ask Siri. Uh, it's becoming an integral part of our life on a daily basis, you know, and they all use something, the technology is called a natural language processing. And it's supposed to work on this one too, where, you know, when I'm talking, it's supposed to be the subtitles. So you can understand the language, the English language, and you can translate it to the computer understandable commands. And essentially, that's what it does. Uh, it has actually, again, this technology has progressed really well uh, in the last three, four years, you know, earlier, Siri never used to understand us well, uh, but now Siri can actually have a meaningful conversation, much better conversation than our friends. Uh, so using natural language processing or using a voice assistance, I believe is, uh, it does not solve crimes, but it's definitely a good uh, assistant or a, a good aid in actually saving some time, you know. Uh, especially in patrolling vehicles, you know, when officer is busy with obviously somebody in the back in the handcuffs and there's certain things going on. The last thing he wants to do is start keying in, you know, detailed reports and so on. Rather, at that point of time, you can just talk to the computer and it understands and responds back. You know, like in this case, it's trying to search and this, there's a voice given, it understands that, and then it goes and hit, uh, gets information back. You know, rather than using that, you know, rather than uh, typing in and keying in, if you just use and talk to it and it can, it can do the work, I think that would again save some time to the officers. And by the way, a lot of these thoughts and ideas were actually not, are not it's not that, uh, I talked about putting the innovative solutions, but it mostly it's, it's about uh, the need. So most of these thoughts or ideas that we're putting together have actually come from the officers. Uh, one of these, this idea has actually come from a Los Angeles sheriff uh, chief, where he was actually, we were implementing use of force reporting and complaints and any, any of, any of the criminal, any of the officers who actually work in the, in the field, they know how painful it is to prepare all the reports and put in the right tons and tons of information and put it in or key in, keying it in. And, and, uh, for use of force in, uh, Los Angeles, there are about a set of 17 reports, uh, with a very detailed description of the, of the force. And, uh, that's where I think they came up with, you know, instead of keep type, typing in, can we have a voice to text? You know, we talk and it, it got, and that's how it came up. And Google has it. And, you know, with, with the technology advancement and so on, I believe this uh, will be an integral part of uh, the law enforcement agency, any of the systems uh, going, in, uh, going, going forward in the future. Back to you, Marisa. Any questions? Yes, does anyone have any questions? Voice assistant. I don't see any questions, yeah.
What is social network analysis and why is it needed as a part of investigations? Uh, social network analysis is a, it's a pretty high end feature. You know, uh, we talked about network analysis or link analysis where we were establishing links uh, between distant different systems and so on. And when you extend it out to the social network network, then that's when the social network analysis, you again have the relationships uh, across, you know, different people or properties or, you know, any of the other entities. That's what you do. Uh, but the first step towards social network analysis is probably the social media integration, you know. For any of the potential suspects that you have or the offenders that you have, uh, you can always build or integrate with the social media. Whether it is uh, Facebook, Twitter, or uh, Instagram, they actually provide some interfaces, which are called APIs. And you can actually use those social media APIs. Uh, where you can actually search or query for a particular person, depending on certain demographic information. I think the first step toward to the SNA is probably actually using or building or developing the, the social media integration. I think that can be done. And again, uh, there are algorithms based on it. You can actually find the right match of the social media. Uh, obviously they won't be just based on first name and last name. Uh, but we have actually worked on algorithms that actually match to the appropriate profiles and get that information back. And it essentially helps uh, the investigators to map out to the social network and see what they're doing. And one of the, again, as I said before, this again request came from a different officer uh, who were indicating that a lot of times these offenders would actually post it on, on their social media before they commit crime. So having a tab or keeping track of the social activities on, on the media, I think that would help, you know, sometimes prevent the prevent a crime from happening. And that's one of the benefits and advantages of having the social media. Uh, again, we are just talking about the technology features and the availability and the flexibility of the technology. Uh, there is some level of resistance trying to keep a track and, you know, tab onto the social media of course, it's actually available socially, but still, you know, some of the, the Facebook or, you know, some of these agencies would not like to share some of this information. Uh, it depends on the agencies to make that call, but I, we, the features and the flexibility of the technology is available to do that. Back to you, Marisa. Thank you. Yeah, social integration is very important, and I feel like I hear more about it now. Um, so. I, it's very helpful. Does anyone have any questions in regards to the social media integration at all? Okay, we can move to the next topic. Yes, if no one has any questions, we're gonna go ahead and do another quiz. Cool, so thanks for okay. smile. What is the technology behind voice assistance? Go ahead and use the chat window. Fifteen more seconds. I believe in you guys. Okay, we have some answers rolling in. Yeah, so. Good job, everyone. Natural language processing. Yes. Good job. So we have a winner for that one. Sana? Great job, Sana. Congratulations. We can move to the next topic. Why is collaboration important in solving crimes? Well, I think collaboration is a key to solving crimes just because, you know, uh, the people who commit crimes, they keep, you know, they don't just uh, stay in one place, you know, they keep traveling, you know, uh, he may perform a misdemeanor in one city, but go to another city and or another state and maybe performing, you know, like a, like a high-end felony. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely essential to have like a 360 degree view of a person, 
and it's not just one person's job to find you know all the crimes together so it, it helps the collaboration so what you actually need is apart from the investigation platform within that you need a a platform where you can actually collaborate something like a facebook you know uh, facebook for law enforcement uh, with the da daily feeds and the way it can be done is you know, if any of the persons of interest or in any of the persons of interest, we can actually go ahead or entities. Uh, you can actually go ahead and subscribe, just like how you do subscribe in uh, YouTube or you know in, uh, in in Facebook too. And uh, you'll have end up having a list of these people, and then you can actually have on a daily feed if this person gets arrested or if this person uh, got caught in a surveillance camera. So then a different person, a different officer can share the new picture obviously it's been a year so the person might have changed turned completely bald or grown a beard you, you never know so you can get a latest picture as well as have the information where you can actually collaborate or comment on it have the inf inf uh, latest information being shared across just like how you do it in any of the social media but again limited to just the law enforcement and this, this process it actually helps you create uh, investigative leads uh, which in turn will help you solve the crime so the collab collaboration is one of the essential key aspects that you know actually is missing in several of the uh, law enforcement systems because they just work in silos. And setting up this kind of a platform would actually help uh, in actually resolving some of these crimes sooner than later, and even actually curtail some of the crimes. Uh, any questions on this one? Okay, I don't see any questions. So we're gonna move on. What is ALPR? What are the benefits? So ALPR is an automated license plate recognition and we will be talking about it in, in a different context. The traditional ALPR right now that we have in the market is more of uh, just how the surveillance cameras work. I think there would be a camera, and then that camera would be tracking or just capturing all the vehicles, uh, license plate information, and trying to store it. Now, this information, the way it tries to do it is, is controversial a uh, little bit. So, uh, and there again, just like how the facial recognition has some laws around it, I think even ALPR is, is getting into those kind of laws. Uh, what I'm talking about from the ALPR standpoint is that you know you don't need any specialized software, you don't need any specialized functionality. I'm talking about more of using uh, your own camera, your own camera on your mobile phone, and then trying to perform the ALPR activity. And imagine the the usage of it. It's the the benefits of this are huge uh, because the systems are all mapped internally between all the different vehicles and people and persons and so on. I think you can actually do the mapping and figure out just when you click it, take a picture of it, the system has the ability to read the license number and then search the system and map it to the person who's probably owning that, that car or who's associated with it. Not just owning, it can be just associated with that car. For example, if that car was involved in a previous crime and there is a probably a accomplice or you know is part of that and then you can still even find that out. And uh, I believe this is extremely useful uh, for the patrol vehicles. Uh, imagine the number of fatalities that we have uh, and the officers, you know, when there's a traffic stop that's done. Uh, we probably hear so many cases on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, you know. Uh, a, a feature like this, where it comes back when, before they approach a, a vehicle, uh, you, can take a, you can take a picture, search for the information, and then you know we, you can be extra vigilant at that time if this person happens to be armed and dangerous you know uh, again it's an extremely useful tool uh, to safeguard the officer's safety uh, I agree any with questions this. any questions i don't see any questions coming in Moving on, what are heat maps and what are the benefits? 
Yeah, we combine the heat maps uh, and analytics together. I think we, we are talking about uh, as the systems, you know, as the agencies have lots and lots of data together, put together, uh, it would help these agencies to actually leverage this historical information to actually develop heat maps as well as uh, map it to the real real time operational information too to actually get some meaningful. Uh, decision making information for example the heat maps it will actually provide you with you know uh, what times the crimes are happening or what times the high crimes are happening what are the what are the red zones uh, and uh, what is the frequency of it what areas or locations are you know uh, high crime areas and so on all this information can be shown and captured once you have all this put together and this is as again, this information is extremely useful to optimize your beat deployment schedule. You know, you can actually put them onto situations or places where uh, there's more crime or more at the, at the areas where, you know, uh, at the times and areas where there's more crime. And that would help. And apart from this, with the maps integration, uh, if you integrate with the, your CAD systems, it can overlay the historical information with the you know the real time calls coming in which actually helps and aids officers too to you know identify the potential threat areas and actually you know be more vigilant with actually visit that and not only that i think in the combination of it you know if there are any warrants to be served or if, if an officer has to perform a parole visit uh, he can actually map this out and see you know if that area is safe or not or if it's it's, uh, it's potentially dangerous one so that again and again, boils down to the officer safety. Uh, the officers can be more vigilant when they go. Again, similar to the traffic stop incidents. Uh, this information again would be helpful for the officers and actually make a, a site visit or a home visit. Uh, all this uh, is all this all these uh, features. All these features are possible when you actually have that the consolidated system that I'm talking about. Uh, these are again helpful in preventing. Uh, some of the potential uh, threats towards officers. Thank you. Any other any questions? Any questions? No, I don't see any questions coming in. So I believe we're going to be on our last quiz, right? Uh, before that, I think we just have one other topic that we can talk about, which is the mobile integration. You know, uh, we talked about. I think there was earlier a question about the how how long it takes and so on. All the features that I talked about so far, uh, they are not limited to uh, just a desktop or just to a GTAG device in your you know, petrol vehicle. You know, these all features can be accessed or looked at even on a mobile device. So with the technology that's available, you know, everything is, is all web-based, so it's all mobile friendly. And all this can be integrated with your mobiles, uh, which actually means that you know, it can actually deliver uh, real-time or historical data in a blink, right to your, right your uh, mobile, so that it can actually make a decision. Uh, Enabling and access, making it accessible to mobiles that will actually improve the officer's safety. And it actually feeds, you know, with the, feeds the officers with the information on the latest updates about offenders, uh, including their social media updates that actually can allow to take a rapid decisions. You know. I think we wanted to include that. And I think, I believe with that, I think we can conclude the, the technical components side of it. And we can move to the Q and A or the quiz. I'm, I'm sorry. What does ALPR stand for? Go this is the last sentence. question. Yes, your last chance to win an Amazon gift card. So type fast. This is going to be your only way to justify clicking that checkout button later on today. Okay, so we have a couple answers. 
automatic license plate recognition. Oh, yep. Okay. Alicia, 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 Alicia. Congrats, Alicia. Good job. Okay, those are the technical topics that we wanted to give a glimpse. And if anybody, if it has piqued your interest and if you want to have a deep dive, we'll be glad to provide a detailed uh, presentation. But the key takeaways from this presentation, I think we talked about, you know, uh, reducing the investigation time, either through the link analysis, the network analysis, including the social media integration, and providing the 360 degree view of the entities. And we talked about the effective use of advanced technology features like a tattoo search and facial recognition. Uh, we talked about how collaboration and information sharing across officers can actually solve crimes. And uh, we also talked about how the technology can promote the officer's safety with uh, instant and up-to-date information. Uh, it, it was a pleasure to have this, uh, make this presentation and I'm glad that we had interaction with some questions as well. Uh, with that, actually, we can move to the next session, which is more Q and A. And if, uh, in general, if, uh, if the team has any more, if the, if the participants have any more questions, we'd be glad to answer more. And we have another uh, 15, 14 more minutes. Oh, you know what? There are some questions that um, we had earlier in the webinar. Um, okay. So someone asked, "Is this a cloud-based service or on-prem systems needing?" Sys admins to support it. So depending on your, so I think we just want to talk about the technology, but uh, uh, the way it can be implemented, you know, it can be both. You know, if you, depending on your uh, organization's policies and so on, if you are a bigger organization that has their own tech team and they have their own data center, and if you have a very restrictive policies on data going out to cloud and so on, then it can be done on-prem. Uh, the solution can be put in a box and then can be given and set it up. Uh, the only thing is just linking to your own data sources. But if you're a smaller agency and you don't want to, and you don't really have any, uh, uh, any sysadmins, any network folks or any of that, Come to your people, then you can actually put it on cloud as well. And we work with uh, we have worked with uh, Microsoft Azure, and where actually it can be put it on a government cloud, which is actually compliant with the CGS policies, so that you know your data is still secure and compliant with all the CGS regulation. So you you have uh, both of those options. Thank you. And we have another question. On the heat map topic, are there, da are there dashboards using predictive or prescriptive an analytics? So the, the predictive and prescriptive analytics, uh, they, there are dashboards, as I was mentioning, you know, that uh, uh, these analytics are the dashboards that we talk about. There are some of the general ones, you know, with the high frame rates, you know, those things are pretty, pretty, generic and those can be built. Uh, but what, in our experience, I think there are a lot more of uh, very customized dashboards that are requested. As I was talking about, once you have all the data together, you know, those certain customizations can be done, the predictive and prescriptive, you know. For example, if you are in California, there's an assembly bill 109, which lets uh, uh, potentially harmless uh, offenders out into the street. Uh, and then one of the chiefs wanted to have a case study or an analytics, you know, uh, relating to uh, releasing of the prisoners on 109 or the 109 benefits that are received by the different agencies versus the increasing crime rate in that particular area. Now you have all that information in the systems, but then that particular dashboard or that particular analytics, uh, which is a predict which is more of you know linking it together, uh, that can be. Uh, that has to be developed. And again, there was another one, you know, uh, it's on the predictive analytics side where uh, potential fires based on, you know, the serial arson 
the people who actually create those serial, serial arsenal files. So I think that's that's another one, another case study that we find. So when it comes to predictive analytics or the prescriptive ones, you know, uh, we work on case-to-case -case basis. There are a lot more customizations. There are some generic ones that we build, but then uh, there could be some uh, deviations to it or enhancements to whatever we build. Thank you, Krishna. But, that, but that's a good question. Yeah. I think that's where eventually we want to go. Yeah. Everyone's asked really good questions so far. They're keeping you on your toes, Krishna. Yeah. Is there a next slide after this? Uh, any more questions? If not, it's just a... I don't see any more questions coming through. So like uh, Krishna had mentioned, if you want to go further into depth into any of the technologies that were mentioned today, uh, feel free to reach out to us at any of our contact methods below. Um, we have our phone number, our email address, and we're also on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Beagle Analytics. Um, you're more than welcome to ask any questions and we will be happy to, to answer them for you. Thank Great. you, guys. Uh, this was fun. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you.